thanks to my wee brother Al for the uh, great music and uh, thanks to Dell for the great guitar and um, yeah hope you enjoy it thanks bye <laughs> Well, who was Thomas Reed? That's a question that about 10 years ago was almost a quiz question. Late in the 18th century, he was a quite celebrated figure. In fact, uh, I can give you a sense of that. There's a lengthy history of correspondence between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams on a whole range of issues. This is uh, after the two of them had ceased being presidents of the United States, etc. Their friendship was patched up again. And there's one letter that uh, finds uh, Adams asking Jefferson, were you ever acquainted with Dougal Stewart? And Dougal Stewart was Thomas Reed's closest friend, probably, his former student. And, um, and in fact, Jefferson knew Dougal Stewart very well. And so Jefferson writes back and he says, yes, I, I knew Stuart very well. I regard him as one of the two greatest metaphysicians of the age. The other one Jefferson has in mind is Destut le Comte de Tracy. Uh, Adams goes on to say, well, I've just read his philosophy of the human mind. And I believe that in this work, in perspicuity, etc., etc., he exceeds uh, Aristotle, Plato, Descartes, wait, wait, and even Dr. Reed. Now, just a way of saying that uh, Adams did not have to say much more than that because Reed was held in such high regard. One more bit of Americana, uh, because I'm trying to, to have you appreciate the distance over which Reed's influence ranged. He had a profound influence on secondary education in France, which came to be organized around Scottish common sense precepts. In the first major jurisdictional dispute ever settled by a US Supreme Court, this was a 1793 case referred to as Chisholm versus Georgia. It, it had to do with whether or not a citizen could sue a state in a federal court. That's what the issue was. Uh, the opinion in that case was given by Justice James Wilson, a native Scot. And how does he begin the opinion? He says, well, before we get into the details of the case, if you would want to know the foundational principles upon which judgment itself depends, you can no do no better than to consult the estimable work of Dr. Reed, which he titles An Inquiry into the Human Mind. Now, those of you who haven't kept up with U.S. Supreme Courts over the course of decades and centuries, I should tell you that it would be very rare today that the Supreme Court would be citing Reed's inquiry. It's rather more likely they'd be citing Newsweek or something. But there was Reed's influence. He was for many years on the faculty at, at Aberdeen, and then he succeeded Adam Smith in the Chair of Moral Philosophy at Glasgow. What is this all about? And unless you understand the relationship between the very traditions of advocacy, the traditions of British common law, the setting of the courtroom, its solemnity, the manner in which dress of a certain kind and address of a certain kind constitutes an integral part of preserving an atmosphere congenial to deliberation and justice. Unless you've done all of that, the event looks simply comical. You see. Now we do these things all the time. Some of you even find time to read novels. Why are you reading a novel? It isn't really about anything, is it? 
And the answer is, yes it is, it may even be about everything. It just isn't about anything at the level of experience, it's at the level of imagination. I see, so what's involved here, just relations among ideas? I reject the word just. No, it is relations among ideas. Hume goes so far as to say, you know, even those we convince ourselves reach a level of platonic abstraction accessible only to refined intelligence and reason. And what does he offer as an, as an illustration? Geometry. And he says, no, 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 that's experiential also. So next week when Dr. Reed takes a look at this, reflects on Dr. Saunderson, the blind Cambridge mathematician who knows more of Euclid than anyone in this city right now and has never seen a rectilinear triangle and never will, we will revisit the question of whether the best understanding of geometry is in terms of our experiences with drawn objects. It's all in our head, it's all in our head. All Sometimes uh, our head. people of my vintage smirk it's when they hear about a new discipline called experimental philosophy. Well, well I, I, I don't smirk over that. In a manner of speaking, Reed is the quintessential experimental philosopher. And how do I want that understood? Reed regards the core issues in philosophy not to be subject to convincing and settling positions the way we deal with inert matter, but to be approachable by the same methods that have been so fruitful in what even then were understood to be the developed sciences and what today are colossally developed sciences. Systematic observation, measurement where possible, holding one's own private, what, nuances, idiosyncrasies and the like as non-dispositive. How, how does the world actually operate? And you don't take yourself as an exemplum uh, from which you can generate universal propositions. You actually have to go out and do the work. Now, I, I mentioned this first week. Um, the chapter of seeing in Reed's Inquiry, what are all of these elements about? The Idomeneans of fictional people that live in two dimensions. A disquisition on whether animals with laterally placed eyes see in depth. How it is persons suffering squint nonetheless can have accurate visual perception. The geometry of visibles. To some extent the anticipation of Riemannian geometry. What, what's this all about? The, the, these summaries of clinical pathological conditions in vision. And the more you read in that chapter, the, the more you say, well, why is he doing all this? Of course, he's doing all this to point out how you approach the subject. What is the relationship between visual perception and the contents of consciousness? This is how you do it. You study the system, inexhaustibly study the system, study it in its pathological state, in its normal state, in its conceivable states. Study it in lower organisms, do you see? And all of this is to underscore the difference between a kind of introspective Lockean armchair psychology striving to be scientific and an actually scientific approach to issues in psychology. I think because of these methodological differences Reed and Hume are actually great ships, and the metaphor works here. They, they are passing in, in the night. And in fact, when in the last year of his life, 
Hume edited his own work for final publication, sending the works off to Millar, to his publisher. He says, and I think he says in a way that's utterly honest as Hume was, that I believe with these emendations I have answered all of the objections of Dr. Reed and that silly Beatty, he's referring to James Beatty. I think Hume did believe he had answered all of the objections raised by Dr. Reed. I'm inclined to say that I don't believe he answered any of them. That's it.